been discussing outside of this session as well, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. We've talked about transparency in this discussion, giving people their data or, or explaining to them secondary data. AI and, and ML are not particularly known for their transparency or explainability. So can these technologies be helpful or is it more of a hindrance when you're trying to deal with data in a way that feels acceptable to, to large groups of people? I think when you talk about data in the context of machine learning, I think we're in the first generation. Okay, in the, in the first generation, machine learning is just a set of algorithms that take your data and produce a result. What we're doing right now, not, you know, not every company, but the Googles right now, um, they're taking data, right? And they have the capability to take your data and create second generation, second order attributes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I would call, that's what's actually fondly called in industry deep learning, right? And when we get there in a more widespread manner, okay, we do have to face into this challenge of, are, is machine learning bringing more transparency to the data or is it bringing more challenge, right, to the data? Because we, I don't think GDPR, even as it stands today, addresses that very, very well. Okay, because it's something that, you know, certainly my organization, right, we're grappling with. I'm, pretty, I'm sure talking to others, others are grappling with that too, because those second order attributes are being generated today, right? They're being generated through various mechanisms, machine learning included, and we don't have a codified way of governing it. So I have a different perspective. Tom and I disagree with this as usual. Um, <laughs> but it's very important not to chuck all machine learning into one bucket because yeah. there is no such thing. Machine learning is totally explainable in most cases. It's, I'm not saying it's not intractable, it's mathematics and somebody, if you don't understand mathematics, you may not understand why. But 99% like, of the cases you can go like this and go, that's why, and let me tell you why and track it back. It's not complex. We bucket all machine learning into deep learning and other methods and not even all deep learning um, and even then, to some companies that have such brutal amounts of data that they require these techniques, these massive pattern matching techniques to do things. And in some cases, we don't mind when the machine says we've got a tuber. And we have no problem trying to understand why, because it's obvious there's a big blob in the middle of my thing. We care so much if it misses it. So we have to relax a bit. We talked about it in the previous session, if, if you recall, about education it seems to come out in every single session but we kind of continue to have examples where it sounds like machine learning made a made some kind of mistake and the truth is humans made a mistake in using the machine learning and we shouldn't be surprised and we just need much better education about say explainability in these things when these things say 99 times out of 100 are perfectly explainable they're just difficult to understand because they're deep mathematical engineering -y. the maglev example we used before you know we could repeat it here right if you have a train and it uses maglev and you're still going to use it even though you don't understand how superconductors man manage to get that thing going but because to your point tom there's been insufficient generations of education and that now is it's perfectly understood safe and we go with it we're not quite there in this in ml which is why we make the gro the gross i'm going to say gross generalizations of well, kind of unexplainable. No, no, it's, it's, just, it's just that you don't understand it, but it's just fine. We have to tread carefully here, or we do run the risk of creating a very difficult to break myth of this thing that thinks. No, it doesn't. No cleverer than a kettle. It just happens to have a lot of mathematics that I may not understand very well, right? Anyway, my little moan on that. Sarah, do you think that these technologies can be brought to established organizations or is it after their wave of we're going to do everything with data that they're getting weary when someone says well now we're going to do your data with AI? I hope that all organizations even legacy organizations can feel genuinely excited about the capability that is now available to us you know again when I think of a previous organization with that I've worked in with you know 1960s 1970s nuclear technology to be able to retrospectively fit IoT capability into your 1970s technology in a way that those engineers could not have dreamt of mm -hmm. to be able to at a distance monitor 
I don't know, vibrations in a turbine or, or mm. cracking in a graphite core, and then to be able to use machine learning to be able to interrogate that, understand it and respond to it in real time, that's an extraordinary opportunity. Yeah. So uh, the sort of data techniques that we have available to us now, combined and augmented with, with AI and with ML, can be retrospectively applied to any legacy organisation, and, and the opportunity is huge. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so how do you then also explain that? Uh, whilst sort of coming coming back to an idea of, of risk, you know, uh, again, it is a public perception, but obviously it's one that affects CEOs as well, is, you know, if my data leaks or, or you know, Tom, you work with all kinds of data, customer data as well is going to be going to have a huge impact on um, reputation for companies. If you're incomprehensible data leaks, nobody's that bothered. If a customer data leaks, suddenly you've got that headline. But if you introduce um, more opaque technologies like AI and ML, are you just introducing more risk? I don't think the techniques, like Fernando was saying, actually obfuscate or data and like data definitions, right? I think we d disagree a little bit on the generative data, right? But by itself, the methods of artificial intelligence and machine learning can actually serve to clarify, right, um, data, right, that of the ones that what you're using, yeah. The the concepts here would be once again we we talked about scaffolding trust these these concepts like what I go back to is codification. We need to codify, codify and make public. Maybe it should be the organization, the corporation, publicly stick stay stating its codification. Or it could be the government, right, as GDPR, trying to codify, right, some of it, right? What we need to do is codify our usage, codify, right, our methodology so that the public trusts us with their data, you know? Or what I propose, what I talked about also is there's organizations out there now where you take all your personal data, give it to this organization, and the organization will pay you for your data, right? So I, I don't think artificial intelligence ML is a good or evil in this situation, right? It's how you use artificial intelligence, AI and ML, right? That de and how that impacts, right? The data of you, right? The person, yeah. And so Sarah, you mentioned generational differences. We may be of a similar age around the table. Am I allowed to do that? Um, you are. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it just going to get to the point where the next generation has an idea about data? Mm -hmm. um, it's seen the headlines. Some of them may be more technically trained as we see education change. Mm -hmm. Are we just waiting for our own extinction, basically, so that the problems go away? Or do we need to focus on this to make sure that we're supporting what's coming up? Well, wow. it's Tom's point about codification. Mm -hmm. um, the extraordinary thing that happens when there are billions of companies uh, interacting with billions of consumers in different ways is that it starts to socialise a, a, a way of thinking about one's data and, 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 and how you use technology. And so your codification is growing organically, actually. Uh, so uh, accepted social memes about, about you know, what to do and how to use your data and to understand it are, are growing up around us. Mm -hmm. We can guide and we can influence and we can educate and every now and then we can have full-scale EU intervention. But actually, uh, uh, it, it's... it's uh, it's recognizing that these things grow organically uh, and that we need to shape that rather than try and lead it. If we try and uh, lead it and control it, then we'll fail. Mm -hmm. I, I think, um, f I'm obviously not 20 years old, but I was you once, are. right? I'm, I'm young at, at heart, heart, at heart. I think for the consumers, especially around consumer identity, what we have to do is provide optionality, mm -hmm. right? So the um, 20 year old today that doesn't care may care right at 40 when they develop some rare disease right that affects their uh, insurance coverage or costs or things like that so wherever we are in each organization I think as as a society okay we have to cover the spectrum right, of individuals and provide everybody the optionality, right, of sharing their data, mm -hmm. so. 
And that's a form of education in itself. That is. That absolutely is. Mm. Found a I've had terrible trouble with generational issues because it makes me feel like we've been patronizing it. Not in this case, but it makes you feel like you're speaking for them. They're not in the room. They should be in the room. Mm. Even in education, it's us that educate the 20-year-olds. So uh, we're thrifty as a, as a race, right? So you know, the 20-year-olds, in some cases, know, will know things that we don't. In some cases, they won't know any better. But the truth is, we can't predict. If we sit here and we suck every bit of information about how we all behave, we can't predict stuff that happens to us. Memes and, you know, a job which is a social person on Twitter becomes a job. And it's like, we can't predict any of this stuff. So I think we have to be open minded about how people want to use this data. Optionality, I totally agree with. Provide the option. And then as a society, provide guardrails that we think are, you know, clear against our social values in the same way that hurting any, anybody is totally unacceptable in today's world where my autistic 11 year old can be hurt in many new ways doesn't change hurt so let's protect some of those things i think we've got enough going on at those levels that that is going to keep us very busy but like everything we need to have the voices of everybody in society uh, and sometimes again just because we're old doesn't mean we say in spanish that the devil knows more because he's old not because he's the devil and obviously this was a saying that comes from hundreds of years ago where age actually meant something today many of these young folks in accenture we have an enormous amount of them they are telling us how it is mm -hmm. so how do we get that feedback loop working better especially in the world of artificial intelligence where these these nice people come at it it's in their dna it's in their way they think of the world Maybe it's a new change. It's something that is gonna that is gonna revolutionize. So I'm incredibly cautious, and just trying to be to your point on optionality. Keep that open mind of optionality. Give the option, but society must must put a foot down on where do we feel as a society good lies and bad lies, and then police that. Mm -hmm.